Well, good morning, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, I have to say that I forgot to wear green, but I found this in my closet. Look at this. Yeah. So I got, I got the purple lint and the St. Patrick's going on. So welcome to those of you who remember to wear green. We promise not to pinch those of you who are, I did not because we want you to know this is a place where you belong to God, not where we will pinch you. Um, and this is what our, our cards in the front are for. Uh, we want you to know that you belong to God because you're a beloved child of God. As we all have blessings to share, we offer those in brave discipleship of the world. And so as you feel the Holy Spirit move you to fill these out throughout our worship service. Just feel free to do that. Our yellow card is our attendance card. Our beloved card is for prayer requests. Our blessed card is for getting involved in the life of the church. And our brave card is for your financial generosity. And we do all this because this is a place where uh, we, we are wholly loved and we are called to love one another wholly, completely in the love of God. So I hope that you all are getting settled. And as you do, please uh, draw your attention to some of the opportunities to live out your discipleship. Um, one of those ways is our coming up Holy Week services as well as our uh, Easter services. Believe it or not, this is the um, last Sunday of Lent before we go to Palm Sunday next week. So you can order Easter lilies, uh, donating that in honor or memory of a loved one. And then we will also have our spring festival that is coming up, which is a wonderful opportunity where we welcome children throughout the neighborhood neighborhood to come and to participate in not just an egg hunt, but all kinds of festivities. And we have many, many hands involved in that great opportunity to share God's love with our neighborhood children. Um, so please draw your attention to those, and we really want to encourage you to, to sign up particularly for that spring festival. Um, as is our custom in the United Methodist Church, we have many committees. One of those is called our Staff Parish Relations Committee, and I'd like to invite our Staff Parish Relations Chair, Brian Stroll, to come forward as uh, we do have an announcement on behalf of the Staff Parish Relations Committee, uh, which is one that works in tandem with the bishop and the cabinet in the appointment of pastors, and so tis the season of reappointments, and so Brian has an announcement to make. Thanks, Alex, and good morning, and Saint, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, as Alex said, I'm Brian Stroll, head of the SPRC, and do have an announcement. Um, as is United Methodist custom, as Alex pointed out, um, and for the betterment of our congregation and church, uh, we do have an itinerant pastor and elder and deacon uh, system that uh, fills needs where it's needed throughout the congregation, not just selfishly holding to our own congregation. So it's with this, I have bittersweet news that Pastor Meredith uh, joyously answered the call uh, that God gave her to um, go to Keller United Methodist Church starting on July 1st. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to do that um, without, with Meredith, but also sad to see Meredith go. Um, it's hard to see someone that's come up through our congregation for the past 13 years and served so faithfully. Uh, as a leader, we've prayed together, uh, we've served on committees together, we've studied together, uh, and it's, um, as many of you have, it's, it's hard to see Meredith go, so we're sorry to see that. But as a church, uh, we have a responsibility to best suit the needs of our congregation, uh, with the talents and resources that best carry out our mission. And just to give you that mission to remind you, everyone is wholly loved by God and called to love another wholly. Um, so over the next few weeks, uh, SPRC, and it will ask a lot of this congregation to help us discern what those next steps are to fill big shoes and to uh, hit a crossroads with our church and growth and serve the needs of our congregation. So I ask you to keep in prayer uh, Meredith and her family uh, as they go on to their next adventure, as well as the FMUMC family that goes into our next adventure as well. So thank you. We love her. <laughs> see? That's what I wanted you to get to see. <laughs> so do not fear. Uh, this is not the last time you're going to get to have to thank Meredith. Uh, we've got another two and a half months with her. So her last Sunday with us will be June the 9th. 
June the 9th. So keep that date in your calendar because somehow she's going to preach. I don't know how she's going to get through that, but she's going to preach. It's going to be great. Um, and, and we will have a big celebration, but just know that you'll have lots of opportunities to give thanks for her between now and then. Um, Meredith is just a part of the lifeblood of this church and has impacted so many people's lives, as I shared in my email on Friday. Um, it just between disciple Bible study and hospitality and children's ministry and having been here for 13 years with her family, their whole family has made a big impact. And so just also want to thank Gavin. Um, I don't know if he is here or not. There he is. Yes, <laughs> there's Gavin. I'm so sorry, Gavin. You're right in front of me. Uh, Gavin and Xander and Sierra, they're in a big crossroads of their life. Xander's graduating from high school. Sierra is graduating from Southwestern University. And Gavin's in the midst of a job transition. And Meredith's moving churches. So like, y'all, let's pray for them. <laughs> so we love you, and we're so thankful for you, and sad to, sad to see you go, but we know, we know the Holy Spirit is going to be at work in such amazing ways through you, and we're so thankful for the way it has worked through us. So, okay. <sighs> All right, done with that part. <laughs> All right, now on to worship. Um, as we gather together uh, today, we, we honor that God has given us many gifts of the Spirit, and, um, and one of those gifts is that we get the prophets. We get to hear the message of the prophets each and every um, throughout the seasons of our lives. And this Lent, each Sunday, we have been studying a prophet. So this week, it is the prophet Nahum. And as we gather in thanksgiving for God's word of this prophet, I would just want us to keep in mind the abundant love of God, an abundant love that wants abundant life for us all. And so let us gather in praise and thanksgiving um, for God's message of abundant life. Let us worship.
Our prophet for this Sunday is the prophet Nahum. Nahum is one of the only prophets with a sole message for a non-Israelite country, in this case the Assyrians in Nineveh. While Nineveh might sound familiar as one of the star places from the prophet Jonah, Nahum's Nineveh, about a century later, has gone back to its non-God-fearing ways, and as a country and a people continues to intimidate the nations of Israel and Judah, Nahum decries the arrogance and violence of the Ninevites who trust their own idols instead of trusting the one true God. And I invite you to stand as you are able and join in our hymn of praise, God of grace and God of glory. You may be seated. I invite you into this time of prayer. Oh God, we are praying people. Continue to teach us how to pray so that we can align ourselves with you. Unify us in faithfulness to you and your everlasting love. May our songs this morning unite in one voice. May our words blend together in one devotion to you. And may our prayers signify one trust in your grace, goodness, and mercy. We give thanks for the ways you bless our lives each day. Help us to be more aware of your presence so that we can partner with you to listen humbly 
to act responsibly, to allow your grace to motivate our responses, and to understand deeply who you call us to be in light of the prophets we have been studying this Lenten season. It is in you that we live and move and have our being, and so make us mindful of your indwelling spirit as we worship this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite our children forward for our children's time. And for those of you who might be close to being children, children at heart, or serving in our children's ministry, I want to invite you all to come forward as well. So. you and your St. Patrick's colors. Oh, and I got a sticker that says Jesus loves me. I've got one of those just like that. That's awesome. Well, I am so glad to be with you all today. And you're probably wondering, why is Pastor Alex up here with Miss Carrie? That's kind of an odd thing to do. Well, it's because today we're going to have a very special time for Miss Carrie. We are going to pray for her because she has been sick. How many of you have ever been sick before? You've been sick before? Yeah. What kind of helps you to feel better when you're feeling sick? Prayers, yeah? Prayers help you feel better? Yeah, that's a wonderful thing to do. Is it you praying for yourself or other people praying for you? Other people praying for you? Yeah, it makes you feel good inside, doesn't it? When other people are praying for you because you feel all that love. That's wonderful. What's another thing you like to do when you're feeling sick that helps you feel better? People send you get well cards. Ooh, yes, that's a very nice thing that happens. When you get sick, people send you get well cards. What's another thing? Soup. Yes, <laughs> soup. Soup, especially when you've got a sore throat, and especially if it's homemade soup. Mm -mm -mm. That does make you feel good. That's right. What's another thing you like to do when you get sick? A lot of rest. Absolutely. A lot of rest of not doing anything and needing to kind of just stay in bed because your body needs to rest to heal, right? Yeah. Well, Miss Carrie has been sick with something um, that she just found out about, and it's called cancer, okay? And one of the things that happens when you have cancer is sometimes you have to have a surgery. And so Miss Carrie is going to have to have uh, some surgeries to help her to get better. And we wanted to let you all know about it because we know that you are gonna wanna help Miss Carrie feel better, aren't you? Yeah, you're gonna wanna write her thank you, or not thank you notes, well maybe thank you notes, wanna write her get well cards, right? You're gonna want to help her rest, you're gonna wanna maybe bring her something, some food to eat, right? And we're gonna want to um, really just encourage people by helping them to feel better by doing all the things that you all just named, and I know you will. But what I would like to do is make sure that Miss Carrie knows how much she is loved. Because sometimes when we can't see somebody, we might wonder, what's going on with them? So if you ever wonder how Miss Carrie is doing after she's resting from her surgery, you can just come ask me, okay? And I'm going to put this special little box out here on the welcome desk. And so it's got a little heart on it, and you can put a card in there or maybe a note or a little gift or something special, right? So that Miss Carrie knows you're thinking of her. And in this, I have a little special gift from Miss Carrie, and it is a cross. It's called a comfort cross. You want to open it, Sweet. huh? Yes. <laughs> and it's, it's something beautiful. that she can hold in her hand when she's going to the hospital to get her surgery or when she's in bed resting to feel better, and she can hold it in her hand, and it says faith on it. And it reminds us all that our faith helps us in times like this. And I know our faith is going to help all of us for Miss Carrie to know how much she's loved, even if we can't see her for, she'll probably be gone for two or three months, okay? 
And so we're all going to pitch in and we're going to help to make sure that all the Sunday school happens really great and we have a wonderful spring festival and we have a great VBS and all these people out here are going to help, aren't you? Yep, yep, we're all <laughs> nodding our head, we're all going to help. And one of the ways that we're going to help right now is we're going to say a prayer for Miss Carrie, okay? So this is a really fun way to pray and I'm going to invite Miss Carrie to stand up. And we're going to stand right here, and you guys stand up too. All right, and we probably need to have you stand here, since some of us are a little smaller than others. And we're going to do what's called a laying on of hands, and you guys are welcome to do this. Um, but we're going to put hands on Miss Carrie's head and on her shoulders, right? Can you reach or maybe her hand and hold her hand? And I'm going to pray for us, and she's going to feel all your love while we pray for her. Are you ready? Here we go. Dear God, thank you for Miss Carrie. When she goes through her surgery, help her know you are a God who is a helper. You will help heal her, and you will help her know how loved she is. Help us to be your helpers, and show Miss Carrie how much she's loved. Thank you for helping Miss Carrie. Amen. Thank you. Is there anything that you all would like to say to Miss Carrie before we go today? It's just, you have made such a great, you have made Sunday school such a great time and experience. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. All right. <laughs> we love you, Miss Carrie, and we will continue to be in prayer for you. And do not forget that we have this special box that I'll put out in the front, okay? Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 and 12 through 15. I invite you to listen for the word of God from the prophet Nahum. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and rages against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength in many, they will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break off his yoke from you and snap the bonds that bind you. The Lord has commanded concerning you, your name shall be perpetuated no longer. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the cast image. I will make your grave, for you are worthless. Look. On the mountains, the feet of the one who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the wicked invade you. They are utterly cut off. And our second reading is from John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. While Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said th this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his fingers on the ground. 
When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and rode on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. So in 2008, I did something I never thought I would ever do. I bought a minivan. (laughs) It was a moment I'd been dreading. I never wanted to be that mom, but in 2008, I was pregnant with our third child. We had twin boys who were three at the time and little Violet on the way. And I thought, there is no way that I can fit that many car seats in my sedan. And so sure enough, we were off to minivan land. And that car served us really well over the course of their growing up. And we had it until the kids were about 13, so about 10 years. And um, about that time, my little minivan started to have some issues. Let's say when you press down on the accelerator, the speedometer went down instead of up. Um, The fuel gauge basically just stopped working, and so I would kind of have to guess how many miles I had driven to know if the gas tank was empty. Um, And we had a special name that we called this car because of its unpredictability. Uh, We called it Possessed. (laughs) Because that's kind of what it felt like. You never knew what you were going to get when you got in the car. And so one day, um, we were coming home at night. It was about 9 o'clock at night. I had the kids in the car, and David was out of town, because, of course, these things always happen when your husband's out of town. Um, And we're driving home. It's 9 o'clock at night. It's a school night. The kids are tired, and I'm exhausted, and I'm on the freeway, and all of a sudden, the car literally just stops working. I'm pressing on the accelerator, and nothing is happening. And so slowly I am like rolling to a stop in the middle of the freeway. And I am like, what on earth am I going to do? And so I just kind of turn the steering wheel to try to eventually get to the off ramp. And we just kind of roll down the off ramp. And then I turn the steering wheel again and we ended up on the service road. And of course we were all a little little flustered, a little shaken. And quite honestly, I was, I was just a little angry at that point at my car. Um, and I didn't know what to do. It was, it was kind of that moment where you just feel so helpless. Kind of like just a, a train wreck of emotions, of, of anger and fear and anxiety and worry. And then there was a knock on the window. It startled me at first because it was dark outside. And it was a gentleman who said, ma'am, I saw your car roll off the freeway. Would you like some help? (laughs) And at first I was a little nervous because obviously I had no idea who this person was, but he was with another fellow. And they said, we've got a shop literally right there, a car shop. We can just roll your car right in. And they did. It was that moment where in the midst of everything kind of falling apart and not knowing what to do, um, These helpers showed up. These people who offered comfort and care and security and assistance. It was just that reminder of how as we are open to it, we can see God's presence in amazing ways and receive it as well. That memory came back to my head this week and I think it was God reminding me of my need 
to open myself up to trust the many ways that God knocks at our doors for, for help and for healing and for hope, for assistance in our time of needs, because I was having one of those AAA moments, <laughs> a AAA moment where I was just kind of falling apart um, and, and having all kinds of emotions that I felt like I couldn't control. Um, I was angry this week, really angry. I was angry at cancer because <laughs> I'm really tired of cancer. <laughs> I hate cancer. So many people have it, and when I heard about Carrie, I just thought, no, no, <laughs> not again. We love her so dearly. We want her health. We want her healing. Why? Not again. I find myself getting really angry. And then, and then, of course, with Meredith's news about her reappointment, I, I found myself getting pretty arrogant, kind of stomping my foot and saying, you know what? I know just as well about how the Holy Spirit can move through Meredith as the cabinet and the bishop does. <laughs> I think she just needs to stay here. Lots of emotions. <laughs> And my guess is you've had those kind of days too, those weeks where it's just those AAA moments of anger and arrogance and these, these feelings that you just know need to kind of be hauled away for God to come and knock on that door so you can be open to God's hope and healing and help. Because, because the thing is, is when we get, we get stuck in that mode of, of anger and arrogance and being all caught up in those emotions, we can't be open to the ways that God is at work because we're so focused on what we think that we want or we need to control or what we think or we desire. And it makes it so difficult for us to be open and aware of God's presence when we're stuck in that mode that has one word, idolatry. You might think to yourself, well, how does anger and arrogance, how do all those emotions relate to idolatry? Well, Nahum gives us a pretty good example of how that happens. So here is Nahum, the prophet. He is a prophet who's in Judah, time of about 360 B.C. And he is one who is during the reign of King Josiah. And what's happened already is that the Assyrians have come in and they've taken over the northern kingdom of Israel. And, and Nineveh is the capital of this Assyrian empire. And the way the Assyrian empire has done this is incredibly violent incredibly violent, um, kind of that no man, woman, or child left. And, and this, this, this arrogance that they have is that when a nation takes over another nation, that conquering nation's God becomes the nation's God who's been taken over. And so when we hear about this jealousy of God from Nahum, it's not like the kind of jealousy that you and I would feel for a romantic partner. It's literally God saying, those other gods are not the real one. I am. Those Assyrian gods that they're trying to convince you to follow, those gods that you can manipulate and control, you know, those, those gods like Baal where you can, you, can, you can pray to these different gods and get things, like you can get rain or you can get fertility, these kind of gods that you ask of things and if you do it well enough, it's received. That's not the real God. I am. And so... Jonah is, or sorry, excuse me, <laughs> Nahum is looking at Nineveh in a very reminiscent way of Jonah, right? We remember that, that Jonah was one who was supposed to prophesy to Nineveh, and what did he do? Ran the other way, right? And eventually he came to Nineveh, and he told them to do what? Repent, right? He said, repent of your evil ways. And sure enough, they did. God spared them. But then guess what? Didn't last very long, right? And so now the Assyrians are back at it, and, jo and Nahum is telling them, you've got to repent. You have got to recognize your idolatry. 
And this idolatry of anger that's led to such violence, this idolatry of arrogance that they are the best nation, is one that they are being called to repent from. Well, when we think about what idolatry is, it's, it's literally taking something that is human, right? It's not just about these little gods over here of fertility and rain that you used to worship a long time ago. Idolatry is when you take a human idea or concept and you make it into a god. You, you worship it. You idolize it. You honor it. You give it your attention. You give it your energy. And so when we think about like anger and arrogance as kind of these these two sins that literally are built on idolatry, you can see why. And you can see the urgency of doing this because when we get caught up in anger, it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle, right? Your anger puts you in a defensive position which makes you more angry. Your arrogance makes you think you're right all the time, and so you're always trying to prove that you're right, leading to more arrogance. These, when we give these things our attention, when we make them into idols, when we put our time and our energy and we honor them in a way that gives them full reign instead of the big G God, then it's time for our repentance. Now, we only have to look at how this plays out. It's not just in our own personal lives, but just as Nahum did in nations to see the urgency of why this is so important. Because, my friends, we have started worshiping anger in our nation. We only have to turn on the TV and look at people doing this this angry back and forth about whatever the topic du jour is. We have to listen to these politicians go at it to to see the ramifications of anger in our nation. Or or the, the, the protests in which everybody is angry about something. And we have come to the place where we are worshiping anger. And elevating anger to a point where we honor it. Where we honor that God above our God. You only have to look at how our nation is falling prey into the idol of arrogance. To realize the power of this and the necessity of repentance. (laughs) The people who are saying, well, my way is the right way and your way is the wrong way. This red and blue, (laughs) this, this sense of my way is the way that should be obeyed and therefore we are going to have laws to make sure that my way is the way. This sin of arrogance is one that we've started to worship by playing these teams. And so when we start to think about our need for repentance in this way, we we can look at this God that we hear from Nahum, we can think, well, well, God is angry, right? God is angry, so why shouldn't we be? But the anger of God is much different than our kind of anger. The anger of God is about evil. And idolatry is that idea that when when we are giving something else life, rather than honoring the creator of life, is we honor the things that like anger and arrogance that give negative life, it's actually causing us death. And so when we can see how this continues with God as we look at Jesus' ministry and the way in which anger is not about condemnation, right? We see that, that, that this woman who is an adulteress is, comes before Jesus and the Pharisees are all about stoning her, condemning her to death idolizing their arrogance of what they think is the thing to do. And Jesus says, let anyone who is without sin cast the first stone. 
This anger is not about condemnation, you see. This anger is about destroying evil. God weeps when people are in that place of death, of not experiencing the abundant life that God has to offer. God weeps for that. And so it is that Jesus says, not, good job, way to go on your adultery. It's not like Jesus is giving her an out. He's asking her to repentance and then to go and sin no more. Do you see the difference that, that God is one who is angry when God sees evil? but it's not one in which that anger is going to condemn to the point of death. God is one who wants us to worship God and God alone because it gives us abundant life. And so as we come to those places where we look at, at what is making us so angry or making us so arrogant, we too can go to those places of repentance. And find that that can bring us new life. That can, that can open up our mind to be able to understand new pathways of thinking or, or open up our eyes to be able to see new ways in which God is at work or, or open up our hearts to be able to experience more abundant life and living. Whether it's looking at cancer and being able to see all of the helpers that come to bring food and write cards and the abundant life that is possible when we're not stuck in the anger of it. Or looking at the Holy Spirit and how it's going to be at work in Meredith throughout our conference and not just here that helps us to repent into the sin of arrogance to allow her and us to experience the new life of the Holy Spirit. What is it for you? What is that place in your life of idolatry? Or anger and arrogance is getting you to the point so much that you have idolized it. And you can't hear those people knocking on your door of God's help and hope and healing. Let us go to God in silent confession and prayer at this time, asking ourselves this question. How is it that the idols in your life result in these sins of anger and arrogance?
During this Lenten season, we have been praying together our communal prayers of confession. And so I invite you into this time of prayer, referring to your bulletin, or the words will be on the screen for our call and response. Everlasting God, you are with us wherever we go, and you know us better than we know ourselves. You hear the bitter words we speak to one another and see the hurt we cause. Forgive us, Lord. Jesus says, go and sin no more. And us to live in the manner of those who have heard the good news. As receivers of God's grace, we ask for help to be grace givers in this world. In the name of Christ, amen. Hear these words of assurance. Through God's loving power, for you, in you, and through you, there is no sin that cannot be forgiven, no resistance to change that cannot be overcome. Pardon and peace are yours. As forgiven people, let us share signs of peace with one another as I invite you to stand and greet each other with the peace of Christ be with you. As we come to this morning's offering, we want to continue to challenge y'all with our uh, di uh, discipling tasks for this season of Lent. We've been encouraging folks to be journaling in this time as we've been studying through the prophets, as well as finding a mission project to engage in. On the back of your bulletin, you can see there are still some opportunities if you have yet to, to find one that works for you. We encourage you to join. In addition, you uh, might have already received one of these in the mail, or there's one soon to be coming. Um, if you want more, just reach out to us in the church office and we can get one if you somehow didn't get on our list. But we are kicking off our uh, capital campaign here soon, Jubilee Free to Grow. This is, has uh, information about the campaign. We encourage you to, to look through. In addition, there is a magnet that we encourage you to put somewhere, and it has the, a prayer on it that we want to pray together as a church in this season. God, what do you want to do through me? So you also will receive, there's a prayer team that's a part of our campaign that will be reaching out to, to y'all to, to uh, respond with that prayer and also to, to hear any prayers that y'all might have and pray together. So as the ushers come forward, will you pray with me? God, in this season of Lent, as we prepare and hear of all the, the hard things in our life that we struggle to reconcile, we are thankful that you are with us and that you guide us even through the pain and the hardship. We're thankful for this church and the witness we are able to bear to pain and hardship here in our community and beyond. Help what we offer here this day be a part of your mission of love in this world. We give you thanks in your son's name. Amen.
remain standing as we sing together, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart.
And now may you go forth from this place with the love of Jesus in your heart so that in those sins of arrogance and anger all throughout our world, you might share the good news of compassion, forgiveness, and mercy. Let us go forth from this world in peace. And the people of God said, Amen. Let us sing together.